I want to uh, join in uh, Russ's welcome uh, to everyone who's joining us online today. Uh, whether you are a Brown Trail member or not, wherever you are, uh, we're glad you're here and joining us for our period of worship today. One of the saddest statements in the Bible, at least in my estimation, comes from David in Psalm 142, verse 4, where he said these words, No one cares for my soul. There are a lot of sad words in Scripture, and uh, that, that verse has to be up there near the top. For the person who truly entertains that thought, that person is in, a, is in a bad place to think that no one cares. But David isn't the only one who has ever struggled with that question. Uh, it has come up in a lot of different circumstances, uh, in Scripture and out. We just sang the song, Does Jesus Care? And one of the things that I had planned to do uh, this year in my sermon plan, which for a variety of reasons has had to be redone uh, almost completely, but I do want to do this particular series. I'm not going to do them all in a row, but uh, periodically throughout the rest of this year, God willing, we're going to do a lesson every once in a while that begins with that, with that phrase, does Jesus care? And we'll, we'll address that with regard to different life circumstances that we face. Does Jesus care when this happens? Does Jesus care when that happens? And today we're going to consider that, uh, that question in a particular context that we'll look at in just a moment. But it's a question that's been asked often. Um, Martha, in a moment of frustration, asked Jesus that question in Luke 10 verse 40. Lord, do you not care? The disciples in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, overcome by fear, as they were in a storm on the Sea of Galilee, said to Jesus, Lord, do you not care? Doubts are human, but we don't have to let them rule or ruin our lives. Even when we doubt, we have a friend who cares. And there's an amazing story, event, life in Scripture that helps me to remember that. That even when I have doubts, and the kind of doubts that I'm talking about today are what we would call emotional doubts. Not doubts where somebody has sat down and they've looked at the evidence and they've reasoned through it and they reach the conclusion, I don't think God cares. I'm talking about emotional doubts where on the one hand, we know, on the, like we sang, oh yes, he cares, I know he cares, right? On one hand, we know that, but we have difficulty sometimes harmonizing with what we know scripture to teach and we have confidence in Scripture. We believe Scripture. And so on that, on, the, and on that side, we know it. But we have difficulty trying to harmonize that with how we feel. And, 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 we, and we ask, I know it says that, but I just, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out how it can be true given the circumstances. I would call those emotional Doubts, not volitional doubts where, where we want to disbelieve or, or entertain doubts or intellectual doubts where it's coming from a, at least some kind of a, a reasoned um, a process, but emotional doubts. Does Jesus care when I doubt? He does. And here's, here's the, the, the biblical account that helps me to remember that. This is not going to be your typical three points in a poem uh, today as far as structure goes. I'm just going to tell you the story. Zechariah and Elizabeth receive word from God that they're going to be parents. And this son that they're going to have is going to prepare the way for the coming 
Messiah. Luke 1, 17. Can't imagine what kind of, how that news would have affected them. That they're going to have a son. And not only that, the Messiah is coming within his lifetime because he's going to be the one that is going to prepare the way. He's going to be the one that, that announces to the world, Messiah has come. His name would be John. And right on time, John is born. And he grows up, and at some point in his uh, adult life, God explained to him what his assignment was. The Bible says in Luke 3, verse 2, the word of the Lord came to John. And John then began his official work. So at some point, God explains to John himself, here's, here's what you're going to do, here's what I want you to do. And part of that preparatory work for the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, involved John doing a lot of preaching and teaching and baptizing. He preached a message that said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, verse 2. He taught a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Mark 1, verse 4. And God told John, according to Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 and following, God told him... You go out, you preach, you baptize. And on one of these individuals that you baptize, you will see the Spirit of God descend upon him. And when you see that happen, you'll know he's the one. And so John hits the ground running. He pours everything that he has into his work, heart and soul. Completely and thoroughly, he is engrossed in his work. He's preaching to people. He's telling them to get ready because the Messiah is coming. The kingdom is near. He's baptizing people in the Jordan River. His message, yes, is stringent. Repent. Repentance is always a tough message. But he preached it. And he announced what his people had been waiting for. The kingdom is near. The Messiah is coming. What the prophets had predicted is about to come true. And he added, in addition to that stringent message of repentance, he also said in Matthew 3, verses 8 and following, you know, when Messiah does get here, he's going to clean house. The axe is laid at the root of the trees. And every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is going to be cut down and cast into the fire. He is the one that will baptize in the spirit and fire. And so John is, is, is totally immersed, if you will, in his work. At some point, Jesus comes to John. And Jesus is going to be baptized by John. Now John already understands and knows that Jesus is a, a, is a special person. Because he at first says, well, really, you should baptize me as opposed to me baptizing you. But Jesus said, no, this is the way this needs to be. And so John allowed it to happen. John baptized Jesus and John sees the Spirit of God descend upon Jesus. And this voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so John gets the message. He sees the sign to, to specifically identify Jesus as the Messiah. John saw it with his own eyes. But John continues to preach and he continues to baptize and said at some point after that, after the baptism of Jesus, at some point after that, Jesus comes by where John is preaching again. And as he's walking up, John directs the gaze of his listeners to Jesus. When he says, John 1, 29, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He turns his disciples direction to Jesus and said, there he is. That's the one that I've been telling you about. And in John chapter 1, 
in that text, verses 29 and following, notice the, the words of John the Baptist. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Jesus comes up. John's preaching to his students, his disciples. And John takes their attention and he says, this is the Lamb of God. Let me tell you about this. I saw the Spirit of God descend from heaven on him. I have seen it with my own eyes and I am testifying to you this day. That man is the Son of God. And as John continued to, to, to preach and to teach and baptize people, he gained a substantial following. And he gained a good reputation among the people. So that we would read later in Matthew 21 verse 26 that all count John as a prophet. All meaning the, the, the masses of the people in Judea that knew who John was. Luke 3, 7, multitudes came to hear John preach. Mark 1, 5, all of Judea came out to hear John. And there are several references in the gospel accounts to John's disciples. These were people that listened to and followed John. And at some point, again, in time, this magnetic personality, this fascinating preacher with the fire of truth burning deep within him gained an audience with Herod Antipas. Herod was the ruler of all of Judea, that whole southern part of the promised land where Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem was, that whole area of, of the southern part of the promised land was Judea. And Herod Antipas was the ruler of all of that. And John gets an audience with Herod. Herod had a palace that was not far from where John was preaching and baptizing and John ends up there. But a unique thing about Herod was that he had a unique marriage. He was actually married to his sister-in-law. He was married to his brother Philip's wife. And John, on a mission of divine origin... John respected no man's person. He respected nobody above God. And John stood in front of Herod Antipas and said, You don't have a right to Herodias. You don't have a right to be married to her. Mark 6.18 says that John often told Herod this. Well, Herodias didn't care for that. She wanted John dead, according to Mark 6, 19. But Herod didn't. Herod feared John, the Bible says, and knew him to be a righteous and godly man, Mark 6, 20. The text implies that Herod knew that John was right, but he couldn't bring himself to either, on the one hand, end his marriage to Herodias, or on the other hand, put John to death. He couldn't bring himself to do either one of those things. So he kind of split the difference and he put John in prison. He removed John from society, took him out of his sphere of influence. But don't feel sorry for John. Because remember, this, this is the man who, who lived in the spirit and power of Elijah. 
Luke 1.17, Elijah, one of the toughest prophets of the Old Testament. This was John, the fulfiller of prophecy. This was John, the fearless proclaimer of truth. This was John, who Jesus would later describe as no reed shaken by the wind, no wimp in soft clothing. John's going to be just fine. Or will he? Something happened. Something happened to John when he was in prison. I don't know what it was. But one day, and as anyone who's ever been in prison will tell you, every day looks just like the last one. And one of those monotonous days, John asked two of his students, he said, I need you to do something for me. I need you to, to go to where Jesus is. Go, go find Jesus, and I want you to ask him a question for me. The question is, ask him if he's really the one. Or do we need to wait for somebody else? If you have your Bibles, open them to, Mark, to, excuse me, to Matthew chapter 11. Let's just read it in the text. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 2. Now when John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to him, or said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. How could John go from so high to so low? How could John go from that man who stood in front of his own disciples and said, I know and I testify to you that this man is the Son of God. I saw the Spirit descend on him. God told me that would be the identifying marker. I've seen it with my own eyes. He is the Son of God. How could he go from that to asking, Are you really the one? Or is it going to be somebody else? How could he go from so high to so low? I'll offer you a couple of my thoughts. I'd say, number one, he's, he was human. It's one reason why he made that job. He was human. Nobody possesses flawless faith. Even your spiritual hero, whoever that is. Now, you, you fill in the blank. You think in your own mind, who is your spiritual hero? I don't care who it is. That person does not have flawless faith. And so John, when, when he struggled with this part of his own humanity, he, he, was, he was in the company of men like Elijah, who struggled, 1 Kings 19, and, and, and ran away, wishing that God would take his life. He is in the company of the, or would be in the company, in the company of the Apostle Paul who would struggle, especially as he was about to go into Corinth, Acts chapter 18. Peter, who ended up denying Jesus. Nobody possesses a faith that is flawless. And so John was human. I'd say in the second place, contributing to his entertaining of doubt, was he was in an ugly place. Prison walls are nothing like the wide open spaces of freedom. I don't know that.
personally, but I know people who do know it. And if you doubt that, ask anyone who's ever been in one. The tedium of day after day confinement can dampen the brightest spirits of the strongest people. And John was in an ugly place. I'd offer this as a possibility. Perhaps, maybe John had some faulty expectations. When you read through the gospel accounts you, and, and on into the New Testament, the, the rest of the New Testament book of Acts, we find that even the closest disciples of Jesus had some faulty concepts about what the kingdom was going to be like and, and what Jesus as the Messiah was going to do and, and how he was going to conduct himself and, and the nature of the kingdom and all of that. They, they thought in terms of a political Reign, similar to that of David from, from centuries before. and all that, that was their concept of the kingdom. Did John suffer from the same misconception? I, I don't know. It's certainly possible. And if he did, it would have made it even more difficult for him to make sense of his situation. Why hadn't Jesus released him? And punish Herod, if he's going to establish this, this political kingdom, why, why is Herod still in power? And why, why hasn't Jesus come to my rescue? How could he, John, fulfill his important role in the kingdom if he's holed up in a dungeon somewhere? He's supposed to be announcing the coming of this Messiah and the, the coming of the kingdom. I can't do that where I am, John may have been thinking. And so when you put all of that together, his humanity, his imperfections, his, 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 um, his flawed faith, the fact that he's in that, that ugly, terrible place, perhaps faulty expectations, you put all of that together and you can probably now come to see, here's how John could go from way up here to way down here. But that brings us now to where we live. Let's stand on your doorstep for a moment. You know, some of our doubts can be caused by similar things. I mean, none of us possesses a, 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 a flawless faith. We might be in an ugly place. Maybe it's not literally a prison. But our circumstances uh, may have us in, in a difficult place. Maybe we have some faulty expectations. Maybe, maybe what we expect or think God ought to do in our lives don't square with reality. Maybe we live under the faulty assumption that, that people who are faithful to the Lord should always have it easy. When God's never promised us that. Maybe, maybe we, we say, well, look, I've prayed for this, and I've prayed for this, and I've prayed for this, and I've prayed for it a lot. I ought to have it by now. And because I don't now, I don't even know if God's there. Just like with Martha, frustration with her circumstances led her to ask Jesus, do you not care? Fear by the disciples as the storm was raging around them out on the Sea of Galilee. Fear caused them to say to Jesus, do you not care? Confusion on John's part with regard to the whole circumstance led him to ask, Jesus, are you the one? Well, regardless of the reasons behind it, behind the, the emotional doubt and struggle. I want us to turn in the last few minutes here to look at how Jesus dealt with John. The question before us this morning is, does Jesus care when I doubt? Here's the answer. And it comes by looking at how Jesus dealt with John. First of all, Jesus answered John gently. He answered him gently. He didn't berate John's weakness. He didn't say to, to John, 
How dare you? He didn't say to John's disciples, I'm not even going to dignify that question with an answer. Now go tell John that. Jesus didn't respond in any of those harsh ways. He responded to those disciples very gently and for them to take that message back to John. And you know, God did the same thing with Elijah in 1 Kings 19. He did the same thing with Paul in Acts 18. God does not give up on us just because we have moments where our faith is weak. He doesn't give up on us just because every once in a while, because of circumstances or whatever, we struggle with weak faith. Matter of fact, you want to see how much God does not give up on us? Look at how Jesus sought to salvage John's reputation in the eyes of the people right here in Matthew chapter 11. We stopped reading at verse 6 when we looked at what Jesus told the disciples of John to say to John. Now I want you to look in the very next breath, starting in verse 7. As these men were going away, so the disciples of John have turned and they're starting to go back to deliver the message to John. Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, he's even more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. The same John that had just sent these messengers to Jesus with the question, would you ask Jesus, is he really the one? Or are we waiting for another? Jesus said, don't you people forget, there has not arisen a man greater than John the Baptist. Now you mark my words on that. Jesus immediately sought to salvage John's reputation. You know, these disciples had asked this question of Jesus in front of the multitudes. What might they then begin to think about John? John's wavering. John's faith is we he doesn't, he's not even sure that this is the Messiah. And Jesus said, Let me tell you something about John. He is no reed shaken by the wind. The picture there is of these, these swaying reeds that get blown back and forth very easily in the wind. In other words, a wishy-washy person. He's no reed shaken by the wind. He's no wimp in soft clothing. He's a fulfiller of prophecy. And of those born of women, there's not a greater than he. Jesus did not give up on John just because John had a moment when his faith was weakening. He won't give up on you either. Now, Jesus did correct John's perception by reminding him, reminding John, that he, Jesus, was fulfilling prophecy, was healing the sick, preaching to the poor. And all of those quotes, uh, or those are quotes, in Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5, those are quotes from Isaiah 35 and 61. In other words, Jesus said to those messengers, go back and, and remind John 
that these things are happening. In other words, Jesus is saying, I haven't abandoned my mission, I'm fulfilling it. When the deaf hear and the dead are raised and the gospel is preached to the poor, I'm fulfilling what the prophets said I would fulfill. I haven't abandoned my mission. There's no need to wait for another. I'm fulfilling what the prophets said I was to fulfill. And Jesus encouraged John to consider the implications of that. Since the weak or since the sick were being healed, the dead were being raised, what does that imply? Well, it implies that Jesus is acting by the power and authority of God because only God can do those things. Remember what Nicodemus said when he came to Jesus in John 3 verse 2? We know, teacher, that you have come from God because no one can do the signs that you do except God be with him. Yeah, Nicodemus got that right. Jesus is making that same point to John. The blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are being raised. There is no other explanation for how that happens except to bring God into the equation. Jesus is telling John, reminding him of what John already knew. And in essence, that's his message to John. So he tells these disciples of John, go back and tell John this. John, remind yourself of things you already know. The things that you've seen and heard. Ground yourself in what you know to be true. Let your head inform your heart. The heart is fickle. The heart is easily swayed. Jesus wanted John to take a deep breath, essentially, and remind himself of the things that he had seen and heard. What had John seen from the very beginning? He saw the Spirit of God descend and rest on Jesus. What had God the Father told John about that? When you see that happen, that's the identifying mark. That's how I'm going to identify to you the Messiah. John saw that with his own eyes. Go back, John, and remember the things you've seen and heard and let those facts, let that reality inform your heart. Bring your feelings into harmony with what you know to be true. Yes, easier said than done. But that's the process that we have to go through. And I say Jesus would probably say the same thing to you. When you fall into one of those low points, you have to ramp up the personal reminders of things that you know. God is... The Bible is his word. Jesus is his son. God loves me. God is sovereign in control. And we can put to practice then 1 Peter 5 verse 7, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Does Jesus care when I doubt? Absolutely he does. But when those doubts creep in, immerse yourself in Scripture. Pray often to the God who gave us his word. And even when we don't feel like it, trust him. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. And what a great blessing to know that that's true. Pray with me. Gracious Father in heaven, what a blessed privilege it is to be able to come to you in prayer, knowing that you are there 
to listen and to respond to our prayers according to your will. We're not grateful for the times that we doubt and struggle with our faith, but we are grateful that you don't give up on us when we do. And we're grateful that you have blessed us with so much evidence of your existence and your love and care that we can see in the creation around us and that we certainly can see on the pages of your divine word. And we pray, Father, that when we go through those periods of emotional struggle and doubt, that we will immerse ourselves in the things that we know to be true and that we would let those things guide and lead us and in time, by your help, bring our emotional state back into harmony with your will. Strengthen our faith, we pray. Help our unbelief, we ask. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, Brown Trail family. I want to welcome you to our services, and I would invite you to join me in thanking uh, Eddie for such a, a great lesson, just what we needed to hear. Last week, uh, our good friend Kevin Kogus told me that he thought that was the best lesson that he'd ever heard from Eddie. And I think he just raised the bar again. Those of us that know Eddie know he does not do this for the praise of men to be patted on the back, but it is not easy to preach to an empty room to bring such a powerful message and help us focus our minds on our Father and to be uh, so, so thankful for what Jesus did. Um, Eddie's just got a great gift, and he uses that talent to honor God. So I pray that you will uh, uh, reach out this week and, and thank him for, um, for these thoughts. We really, really appreciate that. We have a few announcements uh, here this morning. Uh, as you probably heard, Paul Powell, the, who is the son of Carl and Doris, suffered a, uh, a bad accident this week. Uh, he fell off, fell off a roof while he was working, and he suffered a skull fracture and a broken hand. Um, he had surgery to repair the hand and, and his face, and it went well. Uh, he's hospitalized over in Fort Worth, so let's remember Paul, uh, Paul Powell. Also, as you've no doubt heard uh, the news, that Shirley Wilcox is over in Baylor Grapevine, and she has tested positive for the COVID-19 virus. We want to keep her in our prayers as well as Jim because he's having to wait at home and just get updates uh, on her condition. We want to remember David Pennington as he remains at the lodge at Bear Creek. He's not sick with the virus, but 12 other patients and two staff members have tested positive for the virus. Uh, those patients are in isolation. So let's remember to pray for David's safety and the rest of the residents and staff. We also uh, want to continue to pray for our health care workers, the first responders, the small business owners, and all of those who continue to serve the public uh, during this time. 